Hello again, watch friends. Welcome back. I previously did a, a video on uh, watch collecting, and it was pretty basic. I just uh, included some things that you might want to have to uh, uh, improve your or uh, improve your enjoyment of watch collecting. Um, things like a, a loop, a micrometer, a spring bar tool, notebooks, things like that, magnifying glass. Uh, I like to uh, continue those uh, thoughts and mention a few more things that you might find useful in watch collecting. So the first thing is um, you'll get a watch and let's say the watch is comes on a bracelet. This happens to be a, a nice looking Seiko uh, quartz. But let's say you don't like the bracelet and you want to change it out. Well, of course, you would use a springboard tool that I previously discussed and most of you are familiar with to um, take out the spring bars. And you can see them right here. I'm pointing to right there on each side. And it's uh, a little bit fiddly. Uh, sometimes, uh, and getting them out, it's a little bit fiddly getting them out. Sometimes you'll get a watch that will just come without a strap, just the head. And you can just see the spring bars very easily there on both sides. And, of course, you can use the spring bar tool to uh, press them out, put a strap on, and put it back. The problem is, I guarantee you, the first time you change a strap or a bracelet and take out a spring bar, it's going to go flying across the room. Guaranteed. First few times. Even experienced people have things go flying across their desk. So what I recommend is sometimes when you buy a strap, they'll include an extra pair of spring bars. And uh, they'll even indicate the size. This is an 18 millimeter, obviously. It says 18 on there. But I recommend that you invest 5 or $6 and buy yourself a variety of spring bars. This, uh, I think I believe got on Amazon. I put the link in the description below. It's all different sizes, a whole bunch of them. So when you lose your spring bars uh, or you break them, uh, you'll have replacements. So that's the first thing, spring bars. Replacement spring bars. Second thing I recommend is a demagnifier. Uh, this is a fairly inexpensive device. They can be purchased for, I think, about $10 or so. Um, and it's very simple to use. Um, you take your watch. Um, again, I'll demonstrate with this watch here. This is a, uh, a vintage uh, Helbros. So you would plug it in, obviously. You hold the button down right here. And then you can do one of two, two techniques. One is to simply pass the watch over the demagnifier. Magnifier. Magnifier magnetizer boy that's a tongue twister so maybe about three times pass it over slowly or you can hold it here hold the button down hold it here and then bring it straight up and then try again hold it here press the button down bring it straight up so mechanical watches do get magnetized it does affect their timekeeping and an inexpensive demagnetizer like this is the uh, is the cure for that so that's the second thing I recommend. The third thing I recommend is something called PolyWatch. And this is it's a polish for crystals called PolyWatch. I think it's about 8 or $10 for this little tube. You get a couple different, you get a, uh, a cloth to apply it, you get a cloth to buff it. And as we all know, you don't want to polish your watches too much because uh, you can wear away, uh, at least on the case um, and the lugs, uh, you can wear away some of the material and that's not good. But PolyWatch is mainly used for crystals. So let's say you have a, a very minute scratch on a crystal here. You can put a little PolyWatch on it, just a little dab will do you. Some of you may remember what that saying was many years ago put the poly watch on uh, rub it in for a 
couple minutes, buff it out, and your minute scratch is gone. So poly watch is a, a handy thing to have uh, for those kinds of uh, uh, crystal, minimum uh, crystal uh, repairs. So that's poly watch. The next thing I recommend is a scale. This one uh, is, I think, uh, again, it costs between five and ten dollars. It's a digital scale, and you can see if I take a watch, I lay the watch on the scale like this, and you can see. Whoops! Now you can see that um, it's uh, about 2.34 um, ounces. So just another thing to keep track of your watches. If you have a watch collection and you like to keep stats on your watches, um, it's handy to have a scale. It's also handy to have for uh, other things as well. Um, it doesn't go up very high. It might be maybe uh, it's less than a pound, maybe 12 or 14 ounces might be the maximum, but again, it's a handy thing to have. Um, so here's a, this one again is the Seiko Quartz uh, watch. If I take off my Gnault that I'm wearing right now and put the Gnault on here, you can see that this thing weighs uh, a little more than five ounces. So just an idea for weighing your watches. Very handy, very inexpensive, a useful tool. Another useful item to have um, to aid you in your watch collecting activities is a uh, time grapher. Um, sometimes called the timing machine. Uh, this device can help you um, assess the, the health of your watches. It's pretty straightforward to use. Let me just turn it on here. Uh, they cost between $100 and $150. Um, uh, all you do is you, let me move this out of the way. You take your watch and let's again use the Gnault that I had before. You place the watch in the time grapher and you can do this in different positions. Dial up. Um, bottom down, you can do a uh, crown up, uh, crown down, going the other way. So it's all possible rotation of positions. So you put the, t uh, the watch in the time grapher and you let it, you let it go for a minute or two. And we're just going to wait for this thing to settle down because it, the, the results may be a little bit wacky based upon me turning it around. Let me move this out of the way and go back to the time grapher. And what the time grapher does is tells you several things. So if you look in the first position right here, it tells you the accuracy. How many seconds per, uh, per day, plus or minus, is the watch running at? And it does take a little while to settle down, like I said. Uh, the other thing is, um, Depending upon the quality of the watch, uh, for example, if you buy an inexpensive uh, Seiko, um, it could be running very, very well, or it could be, let's say, 20 or 30 seconds, uh, plus 20 or 30 seconds a day. So uh, some watches uh, can be adjusted. Um, some just are excellent right out of the box. So in any case, uh, we're looking at the Gnoll Ocean Rover. And so the first item is the uh, accuracy in seconds per day. Let me just uh, make sure it's flat here. And you can see it sort of jumped around as I moved it, so we'll wait for that to settle down. Uh, the second item is the amplitude. And the amplitude is telling you um, the strength of the, uh, of the balance wheel. So, um, if we look at, this happens to be, I only chose this because it's easy to see, this is my Hobbering Felix. If you look at the balance wheel here, 
you can see, you get a good picture of it. This is really what's controlling the, the watch's accuracy. So that little wheel is going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and based upon, and it's dri being driven by the, the, um, the train of gears, which are then driven by the mainspring, which is wound either automatically with a rotor, or in this case, it's a, a manual wind watch. In any case, that little um, balance wheel is controlling the, the timing. Um, so, if we look at the amplitude, that tells you how strong the, uh, the balance wheel is operating. Uh, it's somewhat dependent upon the um, position of the watch because um, gravity has uh, different effects uh, on, on the watch at different positions. It also depends upon the, the wind of the watch. In other words, if it's fully wound, it's going to be a little bit stronger than if it's uh, winding down or partially wound. So that's the amplitude. And you can see this is very, very good. Um, you want to be somewhere in the 260 to 300-ish range uh, as far as amplitude goes. Uh, accuracy, um, you can see this is this is really good. Um, cost um, certification, which is usually for high-end watches, I believe is um, something around minus, uh, minus four to plus six seconds per day. So anything in between that range uh, your watch is as good as uh, being certified by COSC. The beat error, this uh, item here, which is showing uh, 0, 0.0 milliseconds, uh, this tells you basically how strong and how, um, how much different the swing of the balance wheel is. In other words, the, the balance wheel is going back and forth. It's rotating in one direction and then it rotates in the other direction and back and forth, back and forth. So this tells you if it's uh, equally um, moving on both sides. So zero means that it is. And the picture that you see, uh, this little graph, uh, that will also um, indicate that. And you can see that it looks like it's one line, but it's really two lines. Uh, if the beat error is, uh, is slightly off, let's say one side is stronger than the other, uh, you will see two lines here instead of one line. And finally, uh, you get the uh, beats per hour over here. In this case, it's 28,800. That just tells you the frequency of the watch. Uh, as you might know, some watches um, are called high beat watches. They run at 36,000 um, beats per hour. Um, 36,600 actually, um, and the the higher the higher the uh, the frequency of the watch, the uh, the more wear and tear obviously on the components. So um, less expensive watches are going to be running uh, at different frequency. For example, you might see uh, 21,600 21, or even 18,000 uh, beats per hour. So. Just, I'm going to throw another watch on here. This is, uh, let me stop it here. I'm going to put on the hob ring, which I just used to show you the balance wheel. Okay. okay the hob ring's on there. Uh, let's start that. By the way, notice it automatically detects the, um, it detects the frequency. Uh, there is a way to uh, enter data uh, if you know specifically what it is, but 99% uh, of the time automatically detecting the frequency is fine. Okay, here in this case you see that um, the beat error is 0.2, so here's the two lines I talked about. So it's not quite, it's not quite um, swinging to the same distance on each side as the balance wheel um, moves back and forth. But also you see that, look at the accuracy. This is, this is really spot on. Um, and I, and it's been, it was this way out of the box. Uh, I did a, a video review of the Harboring Felix. Um, check it out. And uh, 
This is the one where I I was at an event in Princeton, New Jersey, and there were three watchmakers there, and they I, they didn't hear they had not known about Hobbering. I gave them the the backstory on Hobbering, and they looked at the watch and they put it on their two different time graphers. This one here, which is uh, considered an inexpensive one, and also their thousand dollar professional one, and it was zero. Uh, it was it was very strong. You can see 303. The amplitude 303 degrees, and uh, the uh, the rate was zero. The beat error was zero. Uh, they were quite impressed. So one last thing about the time grapher, uh, it only works on mechanical watches. So uh, for example, you can't use it with a quartz watch. Uh, secondly, if you take something like a spring drive, this is uh, my my Grand Seiko spring drive, and if you can see. See how the second hand sweeps there. I did a review of this also earlier. I'm trying to get a good picture of that sweep hand. There we go. Don't mind the light. Yeah, so you can see this the second hand sweeping. On the Grand Seiko, uh, it's not it's not actually moving in small increments. It's a continuous sweep, and the way the Grand Seiko spring drive movement is, the way I uh, and I explained this in my video, is that it uses the feedback loop to actually put a brake uh, to control the accuracy. So you can't, you wouldn't be able to put a spring drive on the time grapher as well. Um, and also, uh, again, as I mentioned, the higher the frequency, um, which is uh, measured by this uh, number over here, um, the uh, the Grand Seiko spring drive uh, is just continuous and wouldn't and doesn't even have doesn't move in small increments. So that was the point about that. Anyway, uh, the time grabber is a useful thing. Um, let's say you were you want to sell a watch uh, and do it on one of the forums or eBay or someplace else. Uh, you can measure the health of the watch and provide that information, and people would think. Uh, more highly of your of you and your your uh, selling uh, of that of that item because uh, you have uh, technical detail that um, a lot of people don't have. Sometimes when you look on eBay on a watch for sale, it has very little information. You might uh, communicate with the seller and say, "Hey, what's the what's the beat rate? What's the accuracy?" And they'll say, "Oh yeah, it runs great. It it's it's uh, you know a minute a day or something." Well, that's not really very good. And if they don't, if you don't have data to provide, uh, you really can't back it up. So I know when I sell watches, I always try to uh, include a, a picture of the uh, time grapher results of the watch. Another item, uh, and the last one I want to mention, is a uh, watch winder. And watch winders come in a variety of. Uh, Different models: the uh, one watch, two watch, four watches, um, and they have features that um, are quite useful. Uh, sometimes they they only rotate one direction, sometimes both directions, uh, and you can set them to do different intervals of so much time in one, so much time in the other, and uh, it's really a useful item if you want to. Uh, not wear your watch continuously, but still want to keep, have it keep time. So there you have it. Some additional items that might uh, enhance your watch collecting activities. I uh, hope you found this useful or found some items that uh, you might want to uh, add to your uh, stable of tools. Uh, that's it for now. So thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time.